Hi, my name is Tara Kachaturoff, and I'm the host of Michigan Entrepreneur, where we feature businesses from startup to stellar. Today, I have as my special guest, Cindy Sierra, principal at CC Consulting. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Tara. I'm so happy to be here. Um, excited to share some thoughts with you. All right. Well, um, before we jump into the meat of the interview, why don't you tell us a little bit about CC Consulting and what you do and who you serve? Absolutely. Well, CC Consulting is a retail consulting uh, group firm, and we do basically retail attraction. We are a commercial brokerage firm, but how we're different from the traditional brokerage firm is that we specifically work with our clients, which are cities, developers, project managers, people wanting retail in their entities and bringing the specific tenants that they are wanting. Is it upscale tenants? Are they apparel tenants? Are they home goods tenants? And most of the groups that we do work with are nationals. And uh, we do a, a, you know, we'd like to think we do a fabulous job at, at creating the type of projects that our clients are wanting to have. Now, what's one thing that's really interesting is you are in commercial real estate, which, Correct. of course, historically has been um, dominated by males. How has it <laughs> been as you've, uh, you know, moved through, through your career right. um, and, and gotten to this point of creating CC Consulting? What's that journey been like as a woman in this right. particular industry? Well, you're absolutely right, Tara. When I started and I've been uh, doing this type of work in commercial real estate for, you know, about the better part of 25 plus years, um, there were very few men in the industry. It just, for whatever reason, and it, it's not an easy industry. It's a tough industry. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, and I can recall, you know, being young and out of college and I'd sit in these meetings and it was basically, you know, 99% men and myself. And I laugh because, yes, the industry has changed dramatically. There are more women in commercial real estate, but not as many as you would think. Um, so I would say I went from 99%, you know, 25 years ago to, you know, I, I would say women make up probably 10% of the industry now. So it is still a very male dominated field. Now, what was it that originally drew you to this field? Um, because, you know, usually, I, I and I don't want to mean sexist about this, but women, they tend to go into residential real estate. What was it about this that um, you were attracted to this commercial end way back when? Right. Well, two reasons. And it's funny because my, my degree is in marketing. Mm -hmm. And honestly, what I do is all about marketing. Mm -hmm. The packages that I send out, I mean, nowadays, let's face it, very little face-to-face -face meetings. When I go to, you know, give a, a, you know, a potential retailer a project, I'm mm -hmm. sending it to them electronically. So the materials that I send to them are critically important. And it is about marketing. And marketing is my thing. So I'm, I was always excited by that. It was kind of the entrepreneur in me. And I come from a family. My dad was a you know, a partner in a cargo airline. So uh, the consummate entrepreneur, and I had that spirit in myself and in, in my work life that I, I love the chase. I love finding the retailer, putting him into a development, working through these very difficult economic problems, which nowadays no deals cheap. I mean, with all the problems that we have with supply chain and et cetera, et cetera. Most of the deals that I work on are very expensive deals. And that's exciting to me. How did you initially get into the commercial end of real estate? Um, did you so start I, out right out of college in, in that area? or Well, my very first there? job out of college, I was a buyer for Saks. I was an associate oh, wow. buyer. And I, I, I love the idea of going to New York and sitting in fashion shows and looking at all the fashions. And that was exciting, except that was probably one week of 52. The rest of the time, it was an accounting process. How many apparel pieces of shirts were at this market and what have you? And I knew that that was not long term what I wanted. So I became a marketing director for a developer that had multiple malls and I would be in their marketing department to try to attract people to the properties. And so, and then how I ended up doing what I do and what my firm does is it evolved. It evolved from bringing people to the malls to bringing the stores that I wanted 
to come to the mall because I knew if you had the right stores, they would come. And so it was really a transition and to the point where, you know, that's that's pretty much 99% of what I do is try to bring the right retailers to the right projects. You know, and it's so interesting. I love hearing about people's backgrounds, especially, you know, that you come from an entrepreneurial family Absolutely. and just the, you know, the marketing degree and how everything leads to that to where you are today it these does. stepping stones i always find that part fascinating about the mm -hmm. entrepreneur's story so right. you are another example of that i love that um mm -hmm. now now early in your career you were working um for some of the uh other well-known developers uh, or uh, companies that are involved in commercial real estate here in, yes. in Michigan. And right. what are some of the um, uh, important things that you learned from those years of working for others that helped catapult you to now having your own consulting firm doing um, those things and more? Well, I learned a, a couple of very valuable lessons. Um, and you're right. I worked for some of the best developers in the country doing some of the best projects, the gardens of the Palm Beaches and the Somerset Collection. And what I realized is in, in my business and probably in most businesses, you never do it alone. Mm -hmm. you, if you have to have a strong team. And that's how you're successful. And the team that I have underneath me, I mean, I have I have a guy who I've worked with, you know, who's been part of my team for the better part of ever since I've had my company. And he is a architect by trade, but a designer. And he has an eye for retail. And he knows, I can tell him, his name's Rob. I can tell Rob what I envision my marketing piece to do, and he creates it. So I couldn't do my job without Rob. He's just, he's my left arm. I also feel the same way. I mean, I my attorney that reviews my deals, my accountant that handles all my bookkeeping and accounting and all the things I need to do for my clients. I mean, that's how I'm successful. It's not just me. It's mm -hmm. my team. And the, I learned that from the companies I worked with. I knew it wasn't just Cindy working on this project. It was I knew I needed to work with all those departments. And a lot of times when people aren't successful, I think it's because they haven't built that team around them. I mean, I think uh, so that to me is critically important. And it is the valuable lesson that I learned in, in, early in my career. And I really applaud you for um, for talking about that, because a lot of times uh, people they I know they know their team is really valuable. But I love that you surface that and Absolutely. you you make it important because it is important to you and for so many reasons. And I, I love that you shared the different people that are on your team that are making together. You're Absolutely. all so much better off for it. So, oh, that's great. I love hearing that. Um, and, and just an interesting background about Rob, just the fact that he's got these skills in other areas, but there's a richness that and depth that, you know, that brings something else to the mix and that energy really, you know, helps push other things forward in different ways because Absolutely. Our are so important even if they're not related to real estate that's right bringing something that's like making a difference to the team there's no question about that no question. that's great um another question i had now i know you mentioned things like um working at some uh, for things at the somerset collection which has gone through tremendous amount of change in the past few years right, uh, right. people leaving people coming people leaving more people yeah. coming right. late openings like for hermes um you know uh, and the gardens of palm beaches how are you getting involved in these uh types of projects is it through being brought in through other organizations how do you get on these projects or get involved with these projects even campus marshes detroit and also downtown detroit right now how how do you i mean there's only so much time you have in a day but how do you get <laughs> into the projects or get on the projects how does this work in that world that you're in you know i, I mean i just i think part of it just knock on wood i'm extraordinarily lucky you know i so i've been doing this for 25 years and um you know i, I never really actively look for projects they seem to find me so <laughs> you know and that i think is just lucky but i think when i when you have success especially in my field in bringing the right retailers to a project that the client is extremely happy. You know, it's a very small little retail world. People talk, people know. Um, and so that good business feeds good business. 
-hmm. And so and the next thing I know, I have another developer saying, hey, Cindy, I got a project. Or I have a city saying, hey, Cindy, you did great in that city. You know, it's like 99% lease now with all the tenants they wanted. We work on my city. So, you know, and I say this when I'm asked, you know, like, what's the key to your success? It's like, mind the business you're doing day to day. Because those clients don't look at the future, like, mm -hmm. you know, don't say, oh, I want to do this project and I'm not, I'm just going to push by what I'm doing now. You got to hit, you got to be all in. You got to, and I have a little saying, I'll tell you my saying. It's like, how can I live the high life if I don't wear the high heels? <laughs> Being in retail, I mean, think about that. You know, it's like, you got to walk the walk and talk the talk, right? And it, like I said, you know, it sounds glamorous and, oh, Cindy's doing retail, you know, consulting. I recently posted on LinkedIn and somebody said, oh, my gosh, you've got the dream job. Well, yeah, but they don't see they see the announcements <laughs> that I'm doing of the projects. They don't see the tough parts of doing the economics and some of the other things that have to be done to make these deals happen. Including a lot of tough conversations and negotiation. It's not just, um, yeah, not always. What is it? Not always easy. and unicorns. It's not all so easy right. <laughs> and long hours and weekends. That's um, right. Now, um, I did actually uh, see something, uh, a posting about Gucci downtown Detroit. Is that a project of yours? A where? I'm the, sorry. The Gucci store in downtown. That, Detroit? that is not mine. No, not that yours. is not mine. No, I didn't do that. I've, I've interacted with Gucci, you know, through the years on and off for a long time. But that particular deal was not mine, but I'm very excited because, you know, when the city of Detroit thrives, we all thrive. And yeah, um, to see them bring the, a luxury retailer uh, like a Gucci to downtown Detroit is just, you know, it, it, we all embrace it. And it's so exciting for everyone involved. And, uh, you know, I know you've worked on things like the Somerset, you know, uh, situations, real estate situations around Somerset Collection and Gardens of Palm Beaches. Um, in those things, um, were you bringing in, in uh, like um, high-end retailers to those uh, mall environments? Is that what you were doing? And Well, so that was, you know, those were some of the folks that I worked with mm -hmm. when I was not on my own, mm -hmm. when I was working for companies. So Forbes owns the Somerset Collection and the Gardens of the Palm Beaches. So I, I was involved in both of those projects. And it's funny, I, as I mentioned, I went from marketing to leasing. Mm -hmm. And so I was not in leasing, I was in marketing. But in being in marketing, I was participating in many of the tours that came to town. I can recall when, you know, Tiffany's was looking and oh, wow. um, Henry Bendel was looking and some of the folks that were looking, high profile retailers that were not in the market, I was very involved with the tours. Oh, and so, um, and, and, you know, it's the tours and getting people to come to a property, to come to a market that really secure their interest level. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm happy to and very pleased and honored that I was part of those, those times. That's really exciting. And I think Henry Bendel is gone now. I yes. think they're gone. It is. Yes. It's been like a year. Yeah. I, right. A lot of changes. At the a lot time. of changes in retail. Absolutely. Yeah. So speaking about those changes, um, what is, how has that changed? How has the past three years changed? Uh, we kind of see what the environment, how it's changed, but how has it changed your approach to doing business if it has, or how has it changed your focus of, of things? What, what is it, what is it, what's changed for you on your end? Well, I mean, the interesting thing and the thing, you know, a lot of people have said, oh, brick and mortar is going away and everything. We're going to buy everything online. And I'm not. You know, I think the one <laughs> thing that it's proven is that, you know, brick and mortar retail is never going away. I mean, cities are going to fill their cities with retailers because people like to go there and like to shop and it's an experience. And retail as a whole is a tactile experience. Um, you can't do that online. I mean, I am, because of the amount of hours that I work, I'm an online shopper, I'll admit that. But one third of everything that I buy, I return because it doesn't look like the merchandise. It doesn't have the same fabric that it looks like online. It doesn't fit like it should. Uh, we all know that. And, you know, if but, I, but if I go to a brick and mortar store and I try something on and I buy it and I bring it home, I mean, that is an experience. And I think in our world today, 
Um, you know, where we're spending so much time online, we're working online, we're doing so much of our business online and Zoom. What an experience. We want to go out. We, we don't want to stay home in front of our computer screen all the time. And I think that's why mixed use developments are extremely successful today. The malls, the A malls, the malls are never going to go away. I mean, it's just they're evolving. There's new tenants, um, but they'll continue to, um, you know, to evolve and to get stronger, really. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting to say is a lot of the weaker retailers went away, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing because it, 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 it kind of, it, it, it thinned the herd, right? The, the retailers that were struggling, which none of us want to do deals with because, you know, they might not be around in three to five years. Those guys, for the most part, you know, were on their way out probably before COVID and COVID changed that. They, they put them out of business, but now it made way for all the new retailers that are coming in today's world. You know, the Aritzias, the Faraday, the, the hot concept, the Lululemon that's absolutely on fire nationally and internationally. <laughs> For those brands to just accelerate their business, to you know speed up their growth, it's exciting. I mean, it's all these new, and, and in many cases, some of these retailers were brick and mortar, were online that have, are moving into brick and mortar. Oh wow, that's interesting. It is. That's interesting, and I, it's also it's also hopeful to hear from your perspective um, that you don't see these things going away. Because you know, I was con quite concerned as I'd walk through Somerset and just see empty after empty after yeah. empty, and wondering like, is this mall going to go under? Or, <laughs> you know, um, it's you know, because I, I, everybody I'm sure was very concerned, but I can't imagine people spending the rest of their life indoors. Yeah. pressing keys to buy stuff. I can't do it. I have to be there and try things on and it's Absolutely. miserable to do that, but I have to, I can't buy any clothing no. <laughs> online. It doesn't work for me. <laughs> it's, it's, it is experiment, experiential yeah. and it, it's, it's, it's a pleasing, it's a pleasing activity, right? It's fun to go shopping. It's fun to get it's your girlfriend. Fun to get out shopping. around people and see faces. I, I have to do it. I can't be indoors right. all the time. On, behind the computer. Yeah, uh, well, it's good to hear from your perspective, though, that what what you're seeing, because we only see, as a consumer, we mm -hmm. only see stuff that we see. We only right. read what we read in the news. But somebody who's behind the scenes like you, mm -hmm. um, doing the deals and, and seeing what's going on in this 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 industry, both here in Michigan and nationally, gives me more hope and confidence. So I appreciate that. Right. Absolutely. Um, so is there um, one project that you've worked on recently that you're you're free to talk about or in general talk about that you are really proud of? Um, and what was it about that product project that stood out as meaningful for you? Well, I think especially, you know, we're talking about this particular market, the metropolitan Detroit. Um, I started working, the city of Birmingham uh, put out an RFP three and a half years ago. And they had worked with a variety of different brokers and retail consultants and what have you. But, um, you know, they, at, you know, I was interested in, you know, pitching my business, which I ultimately got. The business and so the city of Birmingham when I started working with them three years ago they had a fair amount of vacancy mm -hmm. uh, the rent rental rates were going up dramatically and some of the mom and pops were struggling to make the rents and so um, so I took the client on three over three years ago three and a half years ago and during that time which let's face it we went through COVID I I did seven or eight national deals and um, in big deals in some cases, like the Crate and Barrel, the CB2 store. I had mm -hmm. I had tried to bring CB2 when I was doing work in downtown Detroit unsuccessfully. I mean, they thought they wanted to be down there, but at the end of the day, they didn't come to downtown Detroit. So I wanted CB2 and I, I wanted Crate and Barrel, but I wanted that CB2 urban concept. And they're a phenomenal retailer. And so, and I got them. I got them to come to the corner of Maple and Woodward. And, and that deal helped other deals. 
and deals like Brilliant Earth. Brilliant Earth is a new jewelry concept coming on board, looking at the best of the best cities in the country and its sustainable diamonds and, you know, that are all, um, you know, created. I mean, it's just a lot of these new concepts are coming on board and they, and they did much of their business, even though they were a jewelry store online. And so Brilliant Earth came and Faraday came and Evereve uh, decided to do a larger store and State and Liberty, which is like a Lululemon for men concept that was looking in DC and LA and whatever they came. So, you know, retailers like to come as a group. It's Are a they coming, mentality. Are all of those coming into Birmingham? All of them. I and, saw this and, too. In like, fact, oh um, yeah. I can announce this. CB2 is going to be open. They've had delays. They were supposed to be open last fall. They've had tremendous delays with all the supply chain issues. But um, February 16th, they're going to be open. So oh, in downtown wow. Birmingham. So that's uh, the old Panera Bread. Correct. Yeah. And, oh, and wow. the stores on either side as well. So, but I mean, the city of Birmingham is a different city than it was three years ago. And I will take some of that credit. Obviously, not all of it. But um, I will credit, take some credit I, because it has <laughs> transformed the city. And yeah. now for the landlord side, the rents are very expensive. I mean, the rents are in the 60s to $70 a foot. It's expensive. And, um, you know, but, but the benefit is we've got an amazing tenant mix that, you know, I, I look at all the cities in the Midwest and we compare with all. And, and I think um, Birmingham is going to be thriving over the next many years. That is great to hear. Um, we walk down there regularly and I just, I, I haven't really, well, not in the winter, but I, I actually didn't realize CB2 was Crate and Peril. I did not know that. <laughs> I was <laughs> driving by, I didn't know what it was. It's like, Oh, that's great. Although I miss the Panera bread. I used to like to eat there. So, oh my gosh, I didn't know those were your projects. That's fantastic. Yes. Yes. Wow. So, well, I mean, congratulations. Um, so that, that is, that is a, a project I can say I'm particularly proud of. And in, in, you asked me, you know, how I look for new business or how new business finds me, um, who came to me because of my work in Birmingham was downtown Naples, Florida. So I chuckle wow. because here's this lady that is based out of Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, and she is the person that is, you know, leading the charge on the shopping in downtown Naples, Florida. Oh so, my gosh. Um, but it's know. great because a, a lot of the tenants that came to Birmingham are now looking at Naples and it's a higher end market in that um, the, the income levels are a little bit higher in downtown Naples and the rents are higher, much higher than downtown higher, Birmingham. So much higher than ours. What are they running down there? They're, they're believe it or not, we, when you put charges and everything, they're over a hundred dollars a foot. Oh my goodness gracious. Not, wow. not every, not every project, not every property, but in the heart of the city. Um, yes. The rents are over a hundred dollars a foot. That's amazing. Well, Cindy, I really enjoyed um, uh, speaking with you today, and I would like to ask you one kind of wrap-up question. If you yes. could give one piece of advice to entrepreneurs, what would it be? Um, bar none, um, the one word that I would say I tell every entrepreneur, anyone thinking about doing their own thing, is you must have determination. Because having your own business, it's not easy. You don't have a company surrounding you to uh, fall back on. You're, you, you are leading the charge, you and your team. We talked about the team. So, um, you know, you, you can't be thick skin or thin skinned. You can't. Um, when you have your own company and you're an entrepreneur, you get rejected. It, it, you are. Um, people aren't going to like you. The more successful you become, maybe the more people don't like you. <laughs> um, because you're stepping on people's toes or you're more successful than the next guy. So they don't like that. So you have to continue to have your vision, to charge forward regardless of the obstacles that you face, and you will face them, and keep your eye on, on the ball, which is success for your company. The ability to make your clients happy, to make your clients look good. you got to keep that focus. So 
again, wrapping up, the number one thing I would recommend is that determination. That's brilliantly said, Cindy. I want to thank you so much for being a guest. Cindy Sierra, Principal at CC Consulting. If you'd like more information about our program, please visit us at www.michigananentrepreneurtv.com. Please join me again in the future when I interview another enterprising entrepreneur. Until then, wishing you the best of business.